So it was coming up on Valentine's Day, and I had a congregation member who was notoriously tight. And I happened to ask him, well, what did you get your wife for Valentine's Day? And he said, I got her a bag and a belt. I was surprised, and I said, well, that's great. I, I sure hope she appreciates them. And he said, well, me too. Plus, the vacuum cleaner is going to run much better. Gifts are one of the languages of love, but not every gift is necessarily a, a full expression of love. Uh, and this goes the same for words. Uh, Paul talks about this, and I'm sure we've all experienced it in our lives, people who seem to be speaking to us in a way that is loving, but actually it's, it's coming across as, as painful or critical or judgmental. <clears throat> Paul tells us here, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And so uh, he just talks about the, the way that some people come across as, as just being as jarring as the crash of a cymbals, you know, that uh, uh, <clears throat> when we speak, we want to be people who are you know, being heard as loving, as people who are genuinely concerned for others, and so that all of our words need to have a, a connection uh, that, that is a, a loving connection. He goes on, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. <clears throat> and so it's true, any place you go, that uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so even if you have knowledge or know the future or something like that, people aren't going to listen or heed your advice unless they really believe that you have their best interest at heart, that your actions are, are loving actions and therefore your words are something that they can trust and, and put into practice into their lives. Now, <clears throat> he, uh, he talks about certain things that were thought of in, in his day as, as being the pinnacle of uh, Christian expression, you know, being able to um, speak in tongues, for instance, or prophesy, and then uh, um, if I give away all my possessions, you know, I'm taking a vow of poverty, giving away things, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, meaning to be martyred or to die for the faith, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. And so even for those uh, who are doing uh, the most, uh, you know, impressive things for a Christian, whether that's the things 2,000 years ago or the things today that people would expect would be done by a good Christian, perhaps you know, giving uh, of time and money to missions, you know, attending church, you know, uh, um, speaking about Christ in such a way as to be invitational. If you do all those things and yet do not do them with love, but do them for some ulterior motive, well, <clears throat> there is no gain to it just as there you know, would have been no gain for, for those who, uh, you know, even if you sacrificed your life for Christ, if you didn't really love him, it, it wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't help you. So, so uh, Paul wants us to come back to the law of love that Jesus had proclaimed, because for Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. These were the two great commandments. And so as Paul uh, brings those things out in, in his work, he also is expressing that love is really the highest thing. And all of these other things that we might do, having faith and having knowledge and prophecy and you know, making gifts and so on like that, all those things are, are really uh, have to be ordered by love. And so when we look at whether an action is good or bad, we really have to look at whether it is loving or not. And, uh, and with our impartial knowledge, well, we may find that, uh, you know, we may make a mistake, but if we did it out of love, it, it's going to be okay. And then he describes what love is. And I think that's a good idea because love is not always uh, as obvious because people use the word too much. Uh, they use it about many things, you know, loving ice cream and, you know, certain kinds of weather and the beach. And so, well, that's not really what we mean by love, uh, you know, in, in a biblical sense. What we're talking about is, you know, is the, is the feeling between people or the, between people and God. And so he tells us what love is supposed to be like in case, you know, we've had a lot of bad examples in our life and, and are therefore a little confused. Love is patient, he tells us here in verse 4. <clears throat> and... Uh, there's plenty of times when we have good reason not to be patient. 
uh, plenty of times when people have tested our patients, and yet if we can maintain a, a loving relationship through those difficulties, uh, if we can continue to be patient because we know that the relationship is more important than the issue around which uh, they may have aroused our surliness or you know, caused us to uh, you know, be, be pushed a little bit, if we can see that beyond you know, the immediate problem is a greater issue of us being in loving relationship, then we're going to be a little more patient. Love is kind. And again, we don't always feel like doing the kind thing. Sometimes uh, you know, going out of our way to, to be helpful to someone uh, feels like a burden. But that's what love is. You know, whether we feel like it or whether we don't feel like it, when uh, we are Christian, when we are trying to reflect the love of God in our lives, we continue to be kind. We continue uh, to offer of ourselves, of our prayers, of our compassion, of our assistance uh, to people, whether they have uh, been kind to us first or not, whether we feel kind towards them today or not. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. So he tells us a lot of things that love is not, too. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> the various uh, ways in which we often see love go astray, you know, where jealousy uh, creeps into a relationship and, you know, and, and people are, are using other people uh, so that their boastfulness uh, is, is uh, noticed. And, and, and you know, that, that kind of thing, uh, Paul wants to make sure we understand you know, that happens a lot in life, but that has nothing to do with what Christian love looks like. A Christian love is supposed to be an expression of God's love, and God's love would never be envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It, it's like God is the sun and we are the moon. Now, the moon does not really have its own light. It just reflects the light of the sun back to the earth, and so we, are, we have the moon illuminated for us by the sun. And so just, just the same, we uh, don't have that light of, of, uh, of God you know, original from us, but we reflect it as it bounces off of us and goes in uh, to the community. And so uh, we should not reflect these uh, perversions of love, like boastfulness and jealousy and so forth like that, but rather uh, the true love of God, which is always inclusive, which is always you know, uh, um, uh, sacrificial, which is always filled with patience and kindness and those sorts of things. He goes on in verse 7, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. And I know we want to believe that, and yet we've seen so many examples in our lives of when people stopped loving. Uh, divorces, you know, comes to mind, but, but also many other kinds of relationships where suddenly, you know, the gate just crashes down and that's it. You know, there's, there's no more. Uh, the love is gone. And, and it really hurts when, when that kind of thing uh, hits us and, and happens to us. Or, and it really hurts our own soul when we do it to someone else, too. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a wound that can be healed, but it is a, a terrible thing when love ends, uh, when love ceases to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things, when it, when it breaks. God's love never does. God continues to reach out to every human being as long as they live, no matter what they've done, no matter how much you know, they, they may have pushed God away, there is still that love reaching out. Now, I know it's difficult for us uh, to do that because you know, people have hurt us, and, and for that reason, it becomes difficult. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. And so Paul was very aware, even with his great knowledge, and maybe there has never been a Christian as deep in knowledge as Paul. He was fantastically educated and, and very thoughtful and, and prayerful and had a connection with God that really uh, very strong. And yet he knew his knowledge was partial. And how much more so is our own knowledge of Christianity partial or the circumstances surrounding other people or, or of circumstances in the world? We should know that's partial. But love overcomes the, the mistakes, the, the, the less than perfect, the misunderstandings. All those things can be overcome as we live out 
that love of God. And all of those <clears throat> expressions you know, that he mentions, like prophecies and, and tongues and knowledge and so forth like that, you know, those are all temporary measures. You know, we are able to do certain things to help other people, uh, to lift up the community of faith in this life, but they themselves are not really uh, the end. The end is love. Yeah, and so as we may do things that, that lift up Christ in some way, what we, we've got to keep in mind is this must be a loving expression. We can't let it grow cold. And, and suppose that, you know, we've said this prayer a hundred times, we'll just say it 101 and move on from there. It, you know, when we do that, and, and certainly ritual is a, a hazard of the church, but if we've lost the meaning of it, you know, worship is no longer there. Love is no longer there. And so we need to be reflective about the things that we do, the things that we say, so that that love remains fresh, because it's not really those things that we do or say uh, that are the ultimate. The ultimate is these expressions of love. And when we have that love of Christ shining in our heart, it will naturally spread itself, show itself, illuminate the world around us in a way that the right actions, the right words will somehow come. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put a, an end to childish ways. And we have a baptism today, and I'm, I'm very proud that we have you know, baptisms uh, here in this church, that the faith continues to grow. You know, and, and as a, a child begins to understand the faith, there's a lot of mistakes you know, along the way. Uh, it, it's very difficult to grasp uh, what the meaning of the Word of God is, you know, for a small child. I mean, we work very hard on vacation Bible school and things like that to try to illuminate uh, what Christianity is for children. But, you know, it's okay for them to have an incomplete understanding because ours is too. You know, theirs may be much more incomplete compared to ours, but in certain ways, you know, a, a child's love of God may be more pure. Uh, Jesus even had brought it up uh, more than once you know, that if you can't love like a little child, you'll never see the kingdom of God. And so uh, the love of a child may very well be perfect for God and for others, and, and yet their actions and their understanding be far short. And so baptism is really meant as a beginning. It's meant as a, a, a promise on the part of the parents uh, and, and whoever else is sponsoring them and the other relatives, you know, that this child will be brought up with an understanding of the faith and will be taught the way of love. And we know that children already begin with uh, a heart of love and, in, in many ways. And, of course, they also begin to uh, demonstrate flaws and so forth. As life goes on, it's, it comes to us all. But we want to take that spark of love that is already there, that God placed in their heart uh, before they were born, and, and continue to blow it into life so that it, it will uh, fill their lives and then spill out into the lives of others. And so we celebrate today with a, uh, a family that is, is having a baptism, and we just pray that that love that they have for the child and that, that the love that God has put inside that child, the love of the community for that child and for that family will continue to grow over time. And as it does, uh, we will truly see uh, the power that love has. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. That's the last verse of chapter 13, and he speaks of these three great parts of the Christian way. Faith, uh, the, the things that we believe, and the, uh, the one that we believe in, you know, that, that faith, that understanding. Well, it is important for us now that we have this faith because there are so many ways in which we do not have sight. And so we have to believe that, uh, uh, that, that God's word is true and that uh, we, we can love, we, we can overcome the obstacles that come into our lives. But faith doesn't endure forever because there comes a time when the object of that faith is right there. You know, I, I don't any longer you know, have to believe uh, that, uh, you know, that I, I'm going to have a car if I already have a car. If I have one, I don't need faith that I'm going to have a car because it's right there. And it will be that way for us when we are in the presence of God. We will no longer need faith. We will have knowledge instead. And the same goes for hope. Hope is just critical down here on earth in the broken mess that is our lives sometimes, and it is the world that is around us so often. Hope, without it, I mean, we will fall into a despair and, and be broken. 
we need that hope to, to know that, that God still has a plan and that we can still be a part of that plan. And, and somehow uh, the world can, can move forward from the broken places and we can uh, continue to, to move forward. We have to have that hope. But one day it won't be true anymore. We will be in the presence of the object of our hope, of the, uh, of the, in the presence of God and in, in the presence of the angels and of, of heaven. And at that point, where, what would we hope for then? Nothing. All is uh, right there. But love is different. Love is eternal. It begins before the world was created. The world was created out of the love of God. That's why God created, because of his love. And it will continue after the world is, it ceases to exist. Love goes on beyond the grave. We cannot say that, our, you know, that a, a person who has passed from us no longer loves us. That is not true. Their love is probably more pure now than it ever was. And love is the most enduring thing in the world. This love can continue to carry us uh, forward and, and to live in, inside of us as it is reflected from God's love to us, it becomes our love to others. And so whatever it is that we do, in whatever places we find ourselves, love is the answer. They say that love makes the world go round, but I wouldn't say that that's quite true. What I would say is love is what makes life worth living. And that is so much more valuable. And so let us seek love in our lives. Let us seek to declare love, to demonstrate love, to be a part of what God's love is doing for the world.